Romans chapter 12, the part that I want to focus on is there in verse number one, where the Bible reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the title of my sermon this morning is this, Loosen Your Grip on the Things of This World. The short title would just be Loosen Your Grip, and the long title would be Loosen Your Grip on the Things of This World. Now go, if you would, to Job chapter 1. God has blessed all of us with a lot of blessings that are in our physical world, in the lives that we live, whether that be with a, a wife or a husband, whether we've been blessed with children, if we've been blessed with a, a comfortable place to live, we've been blessed with a vehicle, or we've been blessed with good food and, and nice things, nice clothes, whatever the material blessings, whatever the blessings in regard to familial relations, spouse, children, uh, whether we've been blessed with a great job or whether we've been blessed with other material things, we ought to be thankful for the things that God has given us. We ought to bless God and thank God constantly for those things. We ought to be appreciative of those things. We ought to enjoy those things and God wants us to enjoy those things and he repeatedly tells us to enjoy those things. But we need to loosen our grip on the things of this world and we need to be willing, number one, to sacrifice everything. There's nothing in this world that we should not be willing to sacrifice for the Lord. Now, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, you go ahead and go to Job 1. But in Revelation 2, 10, the Bible reads, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. According to that verse, God even expects us to be willing to sacrifice our own lives, even to be faithful unto death. He even expects us to sacrifice our freedom and be willing to go to prison. He says that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. We ought to be willing to sacrifice everything, even our own selves. Look at Job chapter 1, verse 20. The Bible reads, then Job arose and ran his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Job understood that everything he had had come from God and he was willing to lose everything. He was willing to sacrifice everything everything. He was okay with having nothing because of the fact that the Lord was still his Savior. And then he brings that up later in the book. Go to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter 22. This is the ultimate example in the Bible of someone being willing to sacrifice everything for the Lord. And one of the reasons why it's the ultimate example is that it pictures and it symbolizes the ultimate sacrifice of all time, which is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ himself on the cross. That's what is symbolized here in this story. But in this literal story, Abraham, great man of faith, a great man of God, is asked to sacrifice his only son unto the Lord. This is a test. It says in verse number one of chapter 22, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. The word tempt there is similar to our modern word attempt. If you make an attempt at something, you're trying to do something. So when the Bible says here that he tempted Abraham, it's saying that he tried him. He tested him. And in this test, he is asked to sacrifice Isaac, his son, his only son. And obviously, this is something very difficult for him. Of course, he passes the test. And for sake of time, go ahead and jump down to verse 15. And after he passes the test, it says in verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, 
that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And right here we see that he did not withhold his son from the Lord. He did not withhold his only son, the Bible says, and that's why God gave him a great blessing. This is the ultimate sacrifice when one would even sacrifice their own child. Now, obviously, God would never ask us to physically sacrifice our own child. That would never happen. That didn't even happen in this story. This was just a test. And once Abraham was willing to make that sacrifice, of course, God stepped in and stopped him from making that sacrifice and brought the ram out of the thicket as a substitute picturing Jesus Christ being the substitute. That's why that ram had his horns caught in the thorn thicket because Jesus Christ would one day wear the crown of thorns. That's why it was laid upon the wood on that altar because Jesus would one day be placed upon the wood of the cross. Okay, so it's symbolic. But we see here that Abraham was willing to sacrifice everything. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, and then we're going to look at Mark 10. So if you could turn to both places, Matthew chapter 10 with one finger and Mark chapter 10 with the other finger. You see, we're not ever going to be asked to physically sacrifice our children, but you know what? We may be asked to loosen our grip on our children and be willing to maybe let them go and do something great for the Lord instead of trying to hold them back. There are many parents who would try to discourage their child from going into the ministry and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because they would fear for their safety or fear persecution. There are people who would discourage their child from going off to the mission field and serving in a foreign country because that would take the grandkids too far away and we wouldn't be able to see the grandkids enough or it wouldn't be as safe there. But listen, if God wants us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and if a man is called to go out and preach the word of God and evangelize, the parents should be willing to let go and say, you know what? This this child was given to me from the Lord and this child is a heritage of the Lord and I'm willing even though I love my child even though my child is more important to me than any physical possession hey I'm willing to sacrifice everything for the Lord and I'm willing to even sacrifice time with my child if they have a great work to do for God I'm not gonna hold them back I'm not gonna withhold my son or withhold my daughter from the Lord's service for any reason whether it's concern for their safety or whatever. You know what? That's between them and the Lord. I would love for my children to serve the Lord when they grow up, and I don't care where they go. I don't care if they're rich or poor. I don't care if the world sees them as successful or a failure, as long as they grow up and they love the Lord. Amen. It's all that I care about for my children. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Look at chapter 10, verse uh, 29 of Mark. Flip over to Mark 10. Mark 10, 29. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. The Bible's telling us very clearly that we are to be willing to sacrifice everything for the Lord everything even our own lives even our own bodies the Bible says for example uh, turn if you would to 2nd Peter chapter 3 but the Bible says for example in Revelation 12 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death he said, they love not their lives unto the death. He said, present your body a living sacrifice. The Bible teaches that it's quite normal for us to love and cherish our own bodies. Uh, the devil, when he tempted Job back in the Old Testament, 
after Job had lost his children, they'd all been killed, after Job had lost all of his possessions and wealth, after uh, all of these things had been taken from him materially, and after he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither, the devil then challenges God and says, well, skin for skin, you know, all that a man hath will he give for his life, but touch now his body and he'll curse you to your face. And if you remember, the devil afflicted Job's body to the point where he had boils all over his body, painful sores, and he was itching and burning and scraping. You know, and obviously that's a terrible thing to go through. He, he said that's even worse than, you know, losing that which you possess. But we ought to even be willing to sacrifice our own bodies. See, he says in Ephesians 5, for example, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So the Bible is saying that a normal human being nourishes and cherishes their flesh. I mean, we care about our body. We take care of our bodies. And we don't want to lose body parts, right? We don't want to sacrifice a hand. We don't want to sacrifice a foot. We don't want to sacrifice an eye. We don't want to sacrifice an ear. You know, we want to take care of and preserve our bodies. We don't want to be put in the way of bodily harm. That's quite normal and natural and right for us to nourish and cherish our bodies. But we ought to be willing even to sacrifice our own bodies for the cause of Christ. We ought to be willing to give our life. We ought to be willing to be bodily injured. We ought to be willing to lose our job, our house, our money, our children, our spouse. We ought to be willing to sacrifice everything for the cause of Christ for his sake and the gospels. That's what the Bible teaches. We ought to loosen our grip on the things of this world. Many people today are, are held back from serving God by a fear of loss. The fear of losing friends. The fear of losing a job. The fear of losing material possessions. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5.12, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. What does the Bible mean when it says that the abundance of the rich will not allow him to sleep, will not suffer him to sleep? Here's what it means, that the more you have, the more you have to lose. When you have a lot, you're worried about losing it. You want to preserve all that. And we, as God's people in the United States of America, many of us have a lot or have been given a lot, and we, we, we abound in blessings. And I'm glad. I don't want to have less blessings. You know, I'm glad that I've been blessed in many ways, but we need to loosen our grip on the things of this world and be willing to sacrifice everything, not just be up at night tossing and turning, thinking about how we can preserve everything. And that leads me to my second point, and this is the most important point, because number one, we should be willing to sacrifice everything. Well, if you get the second point down, the first point will follow. Number two, you will eventually lose everything. And this is what people don't grasp. This is what people don't understand. And then it makes them hard it makes it hard for them to carry out point one and be willing to sacrifice everything because they have this foolish idea that they can keep things. Not only can you not keep everything, you can't keep anything. And let me just tell you this, I'm not saying this metaphorically. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not using hyperbole or rhetoric here. I'm telling you right now, you will eventually lose everything. Just realize it. You will lose everything. Look at the scripture, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Listen to me, you are going to lose your house. You say, no, I'm not going to lose my house. You will lose your house. You will lose your car. You will lose your garden. You will lose your job. 
You will lose all your collections, all the things that you collect, all of the miniatures and figurines and the stamps and the artwork. You will lose everything. You will lose your RV. You will lose your ATV. You will lose your guns. You will lose your bank account. You will lose your 401k. You will lose your retirement. You will lose everything that you own. All of it will be gone. Yep. You will lose all your pets. Yep. <laughs> you will even lose, listen, you will even lose your spouse. You will lose your children. You will lose every part of your body and you will lose your life. This is a fact. Nothing in this world lasts forever. Nothing in this world lasts forever. You will not live forever. Your house, your car, everything that you see is just temporary. You're going to lose it anyway. That's why if you live your life and your motivation is a fear of losing these things, you are living life for all the wrong reasons because you're trying to hold on to something that's impossible to hold on to. I don't want to lose my kids. You're going to lose them. I don't want to lose my job. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your house. You're going to lose everything. That's the true story. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. The Bible said in 2 Peter 3 that all these things shall be dissolved. Everything in this world that we live for is going to be dissolved. Now we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The soul will continue on. The spirit will continue on. We shall live eternally in heaven, but the fashion of this world passeth away. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. And they that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You will lose everything. It's just a question of when you're going to lose it. But you can't keep anything. You're going to lose everything. And once you realize that, it'll help you to loosen your grip on the things of this world and start focusing more on spiritual things. Focusing more on the eternal instead of just trying to hang on to everything. And I got to hang on to my money and hang on to all my possessions and hang on to my security blanket and hang on to my security uh, of my job and my retirement and all these different things. You know, you need to just let go and just say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Everything that you see, everything that you see is temporary. All of it. This building, this pulpit, my body, your body, our clothes, our cars... Everything that you can see is temporal. And only that which you cannot see is eternal. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Christ said, but my word shall not pass away. Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Nothing. We're going to carry nothing out. Now, if you would, flip over to Matthew chapter number 6. And that brings me to my third point. The things of this world are to be used and not enshrined. So point number one is that we ought to be willing to sacrifice everything. Point number two makes that a lot easier when you realize that you're going to lose everything anyway. You will lose everything. I mean, why would I spend my life trying to protect my body and trying to preserve my life when I'm going to lose it anyway? Or just doing everything I can to, to just preserve my possessions when I'm going to lose them all anyway. <clears throat> but thirdly this, the things of this world are to be used 
not to be enshrined or to be preserved. They're to be used. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand the sermon because a lot of people take some of these biblical truths and they get an imbalanced view of the world because they're not taking the whole of Scripture into consideration. We need to get a balanced view that understands, yes, we ought to be willing to sacrifice everything. Yes, we're going to lose everything anyway. But what we need to understand is the fact that God also in many places told us that he wanted to bless us with things and that he wants us to enjoy the things that we have. There are plenty of scriptures we could turn to on that score. If we went to Ecclesiastes and if we went to Proverbs and if we went to Psalms and if we, if we went throughout the New Testament, we could see that, you know, God wants us to eat food and to, and to drink and, and to uh, uh, enjoy our, our families and to enjoy our spouse and to enjoy our children and to rejoice with the wife of our youth. I'm not up here preaching Buddhism today and saying that we need to just, you know, uh, get rid of all the things of this world and go walk the earth as a mendicant monk. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we should all put on sackcloth and, and go wandering through the earth and leave our wife and leave our husband and leave our children. Look, that's foolishness. The Bible commands us to stay faithful to our spouse. The Bible commands us to bring up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The Bible tells us that it's totally normal and natural to nourish and cherish our flesh and to uh, enjoy life. I do not believe in asceticism. I don't think it's biblical. But I want to be clear, though, that I am willing to sacrifice everything. I am willing to kiss it all goodbye. That church van out there, I'm willing to kiss it goodbye. This church building, I'm willing to kiss it goodbye. This pulpit, these chairs, these songbooks, everything, that camera, everything, I'm willing to sacrifice all of the things that the church has. And then I'm willing to sacrifice all the things that I personally have. I'm willing to sacrifice my house, my vehicle, my tools, my things. I don't have that many things, so I can't really list a lot of things. But, but, you know, my books, you know, I mean, I'm willing to sacrifice all of it. In a moment, I'm willing to just walk away. I'm willing to toss the keys to the IRS man and say, here you go, it's all yours, buddy, and walk away. I'm willing to sacrifice everything. And because of that, I feel that I have nothing to lose. And I feel that I can preach whatever the Bible says, without worrying about it. Because what's the worst thing that's going to happen? What are you going to do? What are you going to take away from me? Oh, you're going to take away stuff from me that I was going to lose anyway. <laughs> but the problem is, too many pastors today, they have the big, giant, fancy building. They've got the money in the bank or the, the fleet of vehicles. And they've got all the things that they've worked. And they, you know, they've worked their whole life to build that edifice. They've worked their whole life to build that building and that church and they are not willing to let go of those things. And so the preaching has to be toned down and they have to tread very lightly and be careful and avoid persecution and avoid problems with Uncle Sam because they don't want to lose the things of this world. But let me tell you something. I didn't spend the last 10 years of my life building a building. I didn't spend the last 10 years of my life accumulating possessions or, you know, pianos or a pulpit or, or, or nice things or decorations or artwork. No, I would rather spend my life building people, building lives, getting souls saved, winning people to Christ, baptizing people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever Christ commanded. And no one can ever take that away from me. Amen. No one can ever take that away. The things that are not seen are eternal. That's where our investment of our time and our lives should be. And we'll never have to kiss that goodbye, but we'll have to kiss every person in our life goodbye at some point. We'll have to kiss everything goodbye at some point. One day, either I will pass away or my wife will pass away and we will no longer be married. That is the true reality of our world. We're not Mormons where my wife and I are going to go off on some other planet and live happily ever after 
making spirit babies and being our own god and goddess of our own planet. That's a false doctrine. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And listen, I love my wife dearly. I cherish my wife dearly. I know that she loves and cherishes me. And that is the most important human relationship that I have in this life. But I know that one day it will come to an end. I love my children. I love having my little children come in and they, they wake me up in the morning and they climb on me and play with me and we take them places and we can photograph them 500 times a day and we can take five bazillion home movies and then we can take all those photographs and we can back them up on this drive and back them up on the cloud and print them over here a hard copy and put them in a fireproof safe. But one day those children are going to grow up and they're going to be gone. And they're going to go live their lives, you know, God willing to serve him. One day they're going to be gone. One day I'll be gone. One day you'll be gone. One day those pictures, sorry, honey, the pictures are all going to be gone. <laughs> they're not going to make it through the wrath of God and through the, you know, the millennium and to the new heaven and the new earth. They're not going to make it. It's not going to happen. It's all going to be gone someday. I'm not saying don't love your wife. I'm not saying don't love your husband. I'm not saying don't love your children. I'm saying the opposite. But I'm telling you that you need to understand that the things of this world are all going to pass away. The relationships of this world are all going to pass away. So we need to, number one, be willing to sacrifice everything. Number two, we need to understand that we're eventually going to lose everything. And that, number three, things of this world are to be used and not enshrined. What's the one thing that we'll never lose? Jesus. Amen. We can't lose our salvation. Amen. We can't lose Jesus. Our reward, no man taketh from us. Our crowns in heaven, our rewards in heaven, glory with Christ for all eternity, wages unto eternal life. None of these things can be taken away from us. All of these things will last forever. Christ and our salvation, our home in heaven, the people that we win to Christ, they will live forever. If our husband or wife is saved, they will live forever. Our children, if we win them unto the Lord, they will live forever. They won't necessarily be our family anymore, but they will live forever and they'll always be our brothers and sisters in Christ for all time and for all eternity. But we need to loosen the grip on the things of this world and understand that the things of this world are to be used not enshrined. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at some scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And by the way, while you're looking at Matthew 6, 19, let me say this. In 1 Corinthians 7, where we already read, it said, they that use this world, they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. That's why I say that the things of this world are to be used, not to be enshrined. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Bible is saying don't hoard treasure on this earth. Don't bury treasure on this earth. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. You will lose them, he's saying. Moth and rust will corrupt. Thieves will break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That which is in heaven can never be taken away from us. That which is on this earth will all be taken from us. Go to Matthew 25. And keep in mind what we just read in Matthew 6 as we look at Matthew 25, because it relates. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. There's a parable that begins in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now, this represents obviously the Lord giving things unto his servants, which we are also his servants, aren't we? And has God given us goods? Has God given us good things? Has God given us material things? Has God given you a house, a car, 
a wife, children? Has God given you clothing, food, abundance? The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You say, well, I earned that stuff myself. No, it's God who gives you the power to get wealth, the Bible says. Everything came from the hand of the Lord. Everything you have is from him. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents. And by the way, talents here, we think of a talent as, hey, he has a knack for playing the piano. Or, hey, he has a knack for learning a foreign language. When the Bible says talent here, this is a type of money. This is actually like saying a dollar or a, a pound. A talent is a measurement of weight. Because if you study the Bible, there are talents of silver and talents of gold. It's referring to how many pounds of silver or pounds of gold. And obviously a talent's not a pound, but I'm saying they're both units of, of measurement in regard to weight. And unto one he gave five talents. He's giving them goods. He's giving them material things. To another two and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey... Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Now that's not what that's not what these other guys did. Okay, they didn't they didn't uh, put it in the bank and just receive usury. He's saying that could have been just a minimal. I mean, if you would have put it in the stupid bank, at least there would have been some interest on the money. He's saying. What in the world good was it just to bury it? Now, this parable is about carnal things. It's, it's about a physical story of, of, a, of a guy who gives physical goods, physical material wealth, and then they turn around and return a physical dividend. Obviously, God does not ordain us or call us to, to lay up physical wealth for him at the second coming. So we can say, Lord, here's all the money we made so we can give it unto you. Okay, this is a parable. What's a parable? It's an it's a earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? It's, a, it's a, a physical story to illustrate a spiritual truth. And, and what's being illustrated here is that God gives us something to work with. He gives us a talent, if you will, or five talents or two talents. He gives us blessings. Those could be both material goods, money, house, car, wife, children, husband, whatever, or those could even be abilities, like what we use the word talent. And that's probably why we use the word talent that way, because God could also give us skill, ability, and things of that nature. And God wants us to use those things to produce something to present Him with at His coming. Now, that's not physical money. What he wants us to present him with is what we've accomplished for him. Because the Bible says of Christ, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works. So God wants us to work 
while he's gone. He wants us to do works until Christ returns. And then at his coming, there will be a great judgment seat where we will be rewarded according to our works and where we will present unto him the work that we've accomplished. That work is in the form of winning people to Christ, preaching and teaching the word of God, raising our children for his honor and glory. Everything that is spiritual, everything that is eternal, everything that has lasting value, it's not financial. I'm sure everybody here understands that. But by, the Bible shows us the guy who buried it in the earth. And why did he bury it in the earth? Because he was afraid. And what was he afraid of? He was afraid of losing it. Isn't that what he was afraid of? He's got one talent and he fears losing it. He has a very tight grip on what he's been given by the Lord and says, I don't want to lose this. Therefore, I'm not going to use it for the Lord's profit. I'm not going to use it for the kingdom of God. I'm not going to use it to serve Jesus Christ. Instead, I'm just going to protect it. I'm just going to enshrine it. I'm just going to bury it. I'm going to keep it real nice for him. He doesn't need you to do that. He wants you to use it. The things of this world, and, and, and here's the thing, he wants to protect it and he wants to keep it nice because he fears the wrath of his Lord even. But in reality, what ends up happening? He ends up losing it. That brings us back to point two. You will eventually lose everything. And then he ends up incurring the wrath of the Lord because he didn't use the things of this world Instead, he protected and enshrined them. How do we apply this to our lives? Point three, the things of this world are to be used, not enshrined. Look, if you have money, use it. Spend it. If you have possessions, if you have a car, if you have a house, use them. If you have clothing, use it. Anything that you possess should be used for the glory of God. All of it. Use everything. Don't just stockpile it, collect it, hide it, enshrine it, use it. What do I use my house for? I use my house to put a roof over my head, my wife's head, and my children's heads that we might raise up children for his honor and his glory that would go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And if my children do not grow up and serve the Lord, if any one child doesn't, then, then that child is wasting that which has been given them. And that child would be, in my mind, a failure. Now look, if my child grows up and never makes it financially, that's okay. Look, if none of my children ever grow up to be a preacher, that's okay. None of them have to grow up and be a pastor. None of them have to grow up and be you know, consider, you know, win a beauty pageant or, uh, you know, be on the cover of a magazine or, you, you know, uh, some kind of a, a most successful entrepreneur or successful businessman. None of them have to do that for me to consider them a success. All I care about is raising them up for the Lord. Amen. That's what my house is for. My house is a breeding ground for servants of the Lord what it is. My house is there to house God's servants. It's there to house me, a servant of the Lord. It's there to house my wife, a servant of the Lord. It's there to house my children that are all being taught and trained and brought up to be servants of the Lord. It's to be used. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, it looks like it's being abused. When you have nine children in that house, you know what I mean? I saw your yard. I saw your house. It looks like, you know, they're using this world as abusing it. But where no oxen are, the crib is clean. Yet there is much strength by the increase. There is much increase by the strength of the ox. You see, my house is there to be used. I don't mind that my house is getting old before its time. 
I don't mind that my washing machine breaks every year and I have to get a new one. I don't mind that my dryer breaks every year and I have to get a new one. I don't mind that the dishwasher breaks every year and I have to get a new one. You know why? Because these things are getting industrial use. <laughs> my washer runs 24 hours a day almost. My dryer runs almost 24 hours a day. My dishwasher just runs and runs and r the air conditioner runs and runs and little kids are opening the door, slamming the door, opening the door, slamming the door. Open I mean, my house is like a test site for how long things will last. <laughs> have you ever seen those factories where they have a machine that just keeps opening doors and shutting them, opening doors? I mean, our refrigerator is constantly being tested. <laughs> How long can this oven run non-stop before it breaks? We'll find out. I mean, look, our vehicle. I mean, they keep calling us. The, the Nissan dealer keeps calling us and say, hey, want to buy back your vehicle? I don't know if you've seen what we've done to it. <laughs> and I'm kidding, because, you know, we've, we've taken good care of it. But the, the, the bottom line is... Yeah, you can enshrine your house. You know, I've been to plenty of houses that look like a museum. I've been to houses that are beautiful and gorgeous and, and the white shag carpet <laughs> curls around your toes. <laughs> and the artwork is on the walls and the vacuum runs three times a day. And everything's polished and every painting on the wall has a little light over it pointing at it. Every decoration is dusted on a regular basis and it's enshrined. But you know what? I don't, I'm not trying to build a house to enshrine. I'm trying to have a house that's going to be used industrial and the industry is soul winning. The industry is raising up another generation that loves the Lord. The industry is preaching the word of God, preaching the gospel. Hey, it's to be used, not enshrined. I'm not trying to just see if I can just keep everything super nice. No, I want to use it. Amen. Yeah, we could have a much nicer house if we had 2.5 kids. When you have nine kids, things get used industrially. But you know what? That's what they're for, to be used. I want to use the things of this world. I don't want to enshrine them. I want to use them. I don't want to take my money and just lay it up in a bank account somewhere and, and, and have all the different properties and all the different investments and everything. You know, some people wake up every morning and they read the Wall Street Journal to check on their investments. Other people wake up every morning and open the King James Bible and check on their investments Amen. that they've made in heaven. This is, your, this is your spiritual Wall Street Journal right here. All right, let's see how my stock is doing in the kingdom of God. Far more relevant than the Wall Street Journal. It's the truth. People today uh, are, are, are holding on to the things of this world too tightly. But not only that, churches will sometimes make the mistake of enshrining buildings, enshrining uh, vehicles, enshrining things. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm just going to be real open and upfront with you about, about the finances of our church. I blow all the money all the time. <laughs> There's no savings. It doesn't exist. There's no rainy day fund. There's no building fund. There's no building program. I do the best that I can to spend every cent that comes in the offering plate. And in December, I make a point. I literally, every December, drain the account as close to zero as I can every single December. You say, well, you're, you're financially... Reckless and irresponsible. But here's the thing. Our church has never had any debt. How many churches could say that? Never borrowed any money. Never been laid on the bills. Always had enough money to pay every bill, every time, and never had any debt for ten and a half years. Never borrowed money. Bought, bought everything in cash. You say, well, why... Do you spend all the money? Why do you drain all the money? Because you know what? I'm not going to have our church just sitting on a bunch of money because I know this, eventually we're going to lose everything. So why would I sit on a bunch of money? Or why would the church sit on a bunch of money? Or why would you sit on a bunch of money? 
when it's all going to be taken away from you anyway and it could be taken away from you at any moment. The church that has nothing has nothing to lose Amen. and can serve God and sleep at night like a baby because I'm not worried about losing my personal possessions because I don't have any. Right. Say, well, they'll come take your house from you. I'll toss you the keys. You want to come take my house from me? I'll toss you the keys. Because, you know, I owe on it about as much as it's worth. So there you go. Here are the keys, buddy. And then the church doesn't own any. The church is renting this building. We can always rent another building. You see, the reason that the account is drained to zero is because the, the money that comes into the offering plate is reinvested into the work of God Amen. every month. It's just turned around and reinvested into the work of God. It's Because I'm not trying to worry about stockpiling a bunch of money just in case the church shrinks. Just in case, you know, I got to have my retirement fund. or No, 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 the church isn't going to shrink. There is no retirement because we're going to keep on working and working and preaching and winning souls. And we're not going to take one step back and we're not going to stop. And money's going to keep coming in. So there's no reason to save up any money. I'm not going to save up any money. The church isn't going to save up any money because we're going to use it for the kingdom of God. Amen. We're going to use it to do soul winning marathons and we're going to use it to get the word of God into people's hands and to broadcast it and to shout it from the housetops. What is the point in enshrining it? Use it. Why is this piano here? To be used. Why is this piano here? To be used. Why is this pulpit here? To be used and abused. Okay? I'm not trying to preserve this uh, pulpit for all posterity. This pulpit shall burn one day. And I believe that precisely because our church doesn't hoard money, because our church doesn't save up money and stockpile money and buy fancy cathedrals and palaces and stained glass windows, I believe that's precisely why we never run out of money. Because God said, give and it shall be given unto you. I'd rather just take the money and just give it out, give it out, give it out for the work of God. Here, take the DVDs, the CDs, the preaching, you know, take it out and spread it all over the world. Use it. Hey, can we use this money to hold a soul winning event and get a hundred and some people saved? Hey, let's go ahead and spend it on that because nobody can ever take that away from us. Right. Nobody can take away from us the souls that were won unto Christ in San Bernardino, California or in... Atlanta, Georgia, or anywhere else, or in Phoenix, Arizona, or in Sells, Arizona, or in Baghdad, Arizona, or in Miami, Arizona, or in Strawberry, Arizona, or in Congress, Arizona, or in uh, Superior, Arizona, or in, uh, I'm running out of towns, help me out here, that we've done, where we've knocked every single door. Cords Lakes, Arizona, Gila Bend, Arizona. What about all those ones that were off that, 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 that mining route? The Dudleyville, Winkleman, Hayden. Nobody can ever take those souls and unsave them. But they can sure take away a building from you. They can sure take away a vehicle from you. They can sure take away your clothing and, and your things from you. They can sure put a padlock on your house or on your business. They can sure persecute you and seize your goods. But they can never seize the souls that have been saved. Amen. So we as individuals, we as a church, should loosen our grip on the things of this world. Not saying to be irresponsible. I'm not saying to not enjoy the things that you have. I'm not saying to not love the things that you have, especially when it comes to your wife, your husband, your children. When it comes to your... Look, I'm not saying not to love your job. I think you should love your job. I, th I think that there are many things that we can enjoy in life. But I'm telling you, that God wants us to loosen our grip on the things of this world. Number one, be willing to sacrifice everything. Number two, realize that you will lose everything. And number three, use the things of this world. Don't enshrine them. Use them with it in your mind all the time. Well, you know, I'm eventually going to lose this anyway, so we might as well use it. Hey, we're going to lose this church van eventually anyway. Let's drive it till the wheels fall off. Let's use it. Let's pack it full of people. Let's trash it. I mean, look, I'm not saying to abuse it, my friend, 
But I'm saying I'd rather use and abuse than to, than to just enshrine it somewhere. Now, in a perfect world, we'd all take a little better care of our stuff. Right, kids? Take a little better care of stuff, right? But you know what? I'd rather that they use it and trash it than that it just doesn't get used at all. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the things that are not seen, Lord, the eternal things. People in this world, Lord, all they have to live for is just physical things, Lord. All they have to live for is their, is their spouse, their kids, their house, their car, their job. All they have to live for are the things of this world. And then when they lose those things, when they lose a spouse, when they lose their kid, when they lose the, the material things, Lord, they, they have nothing to live for and they sink into despair and despondency, Lord. But thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for our home in heaven, Lord. And thank you for the things that are not seen, that are eternal. Help us all to loosen our grip on the things of this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.